French Renaissance periods are little dots that they put at the end of sentences, but that's not important. Let's talk about these time frames that we tend to see in French, in the French Renaissance. And there are three of them. The first is Francis I or Francois I. And what we see is Italian ornament being applied. Classical architectural orders are going to be reintroduced and used not only on buildings, but to embellish furniture. So for example, here we have uh, these massive columns that are very reminiscent of the Greeks and the Romans. We have a very clean uh, design. We have some Italian Renaissance ideas. This is almost a grotesque on the back, which we dealt with in the Italian Renaissance. But of course, we don't stop there. After 1547, we move to Henry II. He is going to be married to Catherine de' Medici, bringing in more and more Italian ideas. Now, by this point, the Italian Renaissance, as well as Italian mannerism, will have an influence. We'll see uh, fluted pilasters, colonnettes, arcades, cornices, friezes, and moldings, which will be little change from their Italian origins. The use of classical proportions uh, and sort of classical moldings with band patterns and low relief carving will make Henry II forms very graceful and elegant. And what we see here is a greater use of curvilinear form, in other words, curved line. Uh, we also see this elegance and grace that they're trying to draw. It is a very mannerist idea, elegance and grace. The mannerists are famous for looking at the contrived nature of art and basically altering the reality that they see because they go, hey, I'm an artist, so I can change it. I don't have to paint what I see. And so they will, in human figures, elongate necks and arms and legs to give a sense of elegance and grace. Here we see the same thing with this long opening in the middle of this cupboard. And what we see is a relief carving that plays on that curvilinear form, uh, but at the same time is meant to get across this sense of grace. We have the use of columns once again uh, coming in from the Italians. Then we have uh, Louis XIII or Louis XIII style, which brings us up to about 1650. And here we're going to see a lot more Flemish influence rather than Italian influence. Uh, this is the Huguenots coming in and getting involved. We'll also see some Spanish influence. And so we're going to see a greater use of arabesque, uh, which to them can mean a lot of things. It's basically French for Arab-like. Uh, so we'll see that, and we see that very busy decorative pattern here using acanthus and vine work. Uh, we will see the use of, for example, low relief quite commonly, and that low relief will take the form of religious scenes or genre scenes, both of which are very common at the time. And the religious scenes, you'll notice, unlike the Italians, everything is about the clothing that someone's wearing and the form of the, of the entire image. They're looking at the entire image rather than focusing simply on the human form uh, within the image. So the Italians tend to focus on the human form. Northern Europe tends to focus on the composition overall. Uh, and we see that here with this very busy uh, composition in the middle. On this piece, we see very similar ideas, very arabesque decor, uh, very busy decor, but we're still seeing the Italian putti, for example, making an appearance. So we're seeing a, a few different styles. And early on here, whether it's Francis I, Henry II, Louis XIII, what you're seeing is the earliest forms of furniture. It also brings up a big issue, which is there's never a good cutoff. You will always have pieces of furniture that fit halfway in between. They're usually called hybrids, and they're quite common in appraisal and in antiques.